Hey everyone, my name is Avery and you're watching the Crypto News Network. I recently made a video on NEO and I received some great feedback with some people wanting a more in-depth video on an aspect of NEO. So that's exactly what I'm going to do today. So I'm going to go over something called DBFT or Delegated Byzantine Fault Tolerance, which is a consensus method that NEO uses. This video may be a bit long, but I'm going to try and keep it engaging. So here we go. So even before I talk about DBFT, we need to cover a little bit of background first. I'm going to touch on the two generals problem Problem, the Byzantine generals problem, fault tolerance, proof of work, proof of stake, and then we'll get to DBFT. So this is gonna be quite a bit. When I talk about these problems in a second, they might sound a little bit arbitrary. The problems that I'll be talking about are networking problems that represent complex issues in distributed computing. So let's get into it. The two generals problem is an experiment that represents an issue of computer networking over an unreliable link. In this problem, we'll call these two nodes generals. In the situation, the generals and their armies have come upon a city that they wish to attack. Each general's army on its own is not enough to defeat the enemy army successfully, thus they need to cooperate and attack at the same time. The problem arises because two generals are separated by a significant distance, so think of this as if they're like on opposite sides of the city. General 1 is considered the leader and the other is considered the follower. In order for them to communicate and decide on a time of attack, General 1 has to send a messenger across the enemy's camp that will deliver the time of attack to General 2. But this could mean that the messenger could get captured and the message would be lost forever. That will result in General 1 attacking while General 2 and his army hold their grounds. Assuming the first message goes through, General 2 must still acknowledge that he received the message. So he sends a messenger back, thus repeating the previous scenario where the messenger can get caught. This opens up an infinite loop where both parties are sending acknowledgements back and forth with neither general knowing whether or not the message was received. If General 1 receives a message, how will General 2 know that the message was received without an additional acknowledgement message from General 1? You see how this presents a repeating problem? Sound complicated? Well, good. That's fantastic because the two generals problem is currently unsolvable. But I'm talking about it because a newer problem was iterated off of this one and it stuck its roots into the blockchain space. The Byzantine generals problem is more than a fancy buzzword that bounces around Reddit threads on the internet. It is an important distributed computing problem that was introduced in 1982 in a paper written by Leslie Lamport, Robert Shostak, and Marshall Pease, which were a group of researchers performing under SRI International, an independent nonprofit research research institute in California. Similar to the two generals problem, the Byzantine generals problem deals with reliable computer systems handling malfunctioning components that give conflicting information to different parts of the system to ensure consensus within a distributed computing system. So that sounds like a mouthful, but I'll explain it in a sec. The difference now is that more than two generals need to agree on a time to attack their common enemy. The leader follower paradigm described in the two generals problem is now transformed into a commander lieutenant setup. In order to achieve consensus here, the commander and every lieutenant must agree on the same decision. An additional complication though is that one or more of the generals can be a traitor, meaning that they can lie about their choice. So if two generals agree to attack, one could lie about attacking and then he would retreat and that would result in a worse outcome than if they both went and attacked or both retreated. Quoted from the research paper, it states, this situation can be expressed abstractly in terms of a group of generals of the Byzantine army camped with their troops around an enemy city. Communicating only by messenger, the generals must agree upon a common battle plan. However, one or more of them may be traitors who will try to confuse the others. The problem is to find an algorithm to ensure that the loyal generals will reach agreement. It is shown that using only oral messages, this problem is solvable if and only if more than two thirds of the generals are loyal. So a single traitor can confound two loyal generals. With unforgeable written messages, the problem is solvable for any number of generals and possible traitors. Applications of the solutions to reliable computer systems are then discussed. So in this illustration, we can see that Lieutenant 3 is a malicious actor. Looking at the interaction between the honest counterparts, we can see that the decision is V, while Lieutenant 3 is trying to tell Lieutenant 2 that the decision is X. The final result is a majority vote between the lieutenants, and the majority is V, given that two of the votes are V out of three. Therefore, consensus is reached by an honest majority while there being a malicious actor in the system. Now in this next graphic, it might seem at first that with a malicious 
the commander, there's no possibility of consensus. The commander has sent three different inputs to the three lieutenants. So there's no possible way that they would come out with the same answer, right? But not quite. Remember that there are two outputs, attack and retreat. The inputs are different times of attack. Using the majority vote, we find all lieutenants have found the same inputs, which are X, Y, and Z. So how does that even form consensus if they're all different inputs? Well, we can see that the lieutenants have all come up with the same majority of inputs, which is X, Y, and Z. And because they have realized that the commander is sending out conflicting information, they can reach consensus on retreat because it's clear that the commander is peddling malicious info on the time of the attack. The Byzantine general's problem leads us to the notion of Byzantine fault tolerance. This is the characteristic of a system that tolerates the Byzantine failures brought about in the Byzantine general's problem, like I just described. A Byzantine failure is an inherently difficult class of failures where there are no restrictions or assumptions based on the behavior of a node in the system. The algorithm I just mentioned is Byzantine fault tolerant as long as the number of traders does not exceed a third of the generals. Other very variations exist in where solving the problem is easier, and they include the use of digital signatures or by imposing communication restrictions between peers in, uh, in the network. So how does this relate to blockchain? A blockchain is a distributed ledger that is not in control of any one party. It's also not news to anyone that these distributed ledgers hold massive amounts of value. Because these ledgers are honeypots of wealth, it makes sense that a malicious actor would love to cause faults in the system in order to access some of that wealth. In that case, a Byzantine fault tolerance is necessary for a blockchain to operate effectively. So we always hear about this relationship of trustless nodes in a public blockchain. So take Bitcoin, for example. In the absence of Byzantine fault tolerance, a malicious actor could execute double spends or alter transactions, which would pretty much eliminate the Bitcoin blockchain's reliability and would probably render the currency worthless. Proof of work on the Bitcoin blockchain became the first demonstration of Byzantine fault tolerance on a blockchain. But I mean, also it was the first blockchain. Blockchain. Basically, Byzantine fault tolerance is what makes blockchain a blockchain. In an email from Satoshi Nakamoto in November of 2008, he explained the concept in a simple way, demonstrating general Byzantine fault tolerance enabled by proof of work. He provided an example of Byzantine generals brute forcing a Wi-Fi password. So you could relate this back to, you know, generals trying to attack a city. I've truncated the email to the interesting bits and it reads, the generals only have enough CPU power to crack the Wi-Fi password fast enough if a majority of them attack at the same time. They don't particularly care when the attack will be, just that they all agree. And that's an important part. It has been decided that anyone who feels like it will announce a time and whatever time is heard first will be the official attack time. The problem is that the network is not instantaneous and if two generals announce different attack times, at close to the same time. Some may hear one first and others hear the other first. They use a proof of work chain to solve the problem. Once each general receives whatever attack time he hears first, he sets his computer to solve an extremely difficult proof of work problem that includes the attack time in its hash. The proof of work is so difficult, it's expected to take 10 minutes of them all working at once before one of them finds a solution. Once one of the generals finds a proof of work, he broadcasts it to the network and everyone changes their current proof of work computation to include that proof of work in the hash that they're working on. If anyone was working on a different attack time, they switch to this one because its proof of work chain is now longer. After two hours, one attack time should be hashed by a chain of 12 proof of works. Every general, just by verifying the difficulty of the proof of work chain, can estimate how much parallel CPU power per hour was expended on it to see that it must have required the majority of the computers to produce that much proof of work in the allotted time. They had to all have seen it because the proof of work is proof that they worked on it. If the CPU power exists by the proof of work chain is sufficient to crack the password, they can safely attack at the agreed time. So that was a lot of info. What Satoshi's idea enabled was guaranteeing a way for an honest majority to come to consensus over something. Remember he said, they don't particularly care when the attack will be, just that they all agree. What he means by that is that by being able to calculate the expended CPU power on finding the proof of works, it can be seen whether or not the majority had come to consensus over that move to attack the Wi-Fi password. Putting this into more cryptocurrency-esque words, a Byzantine fault within Bitcoin would be a double spend, consistent censoring of transactions, or anything that would really cause the entire system to fail. Proof of work in Bitcoin is used as a means of processing transactions. So with this, in order for an actor to submit the next block to be added to the blockchain, they have to find a solution to a particular mathematical problem. These people are called miners, and the actor most likely to solve the mathematical problem first is the one with the most computing power. When that problem is solved, a block 
block is mined and the miner gets rewarded with Bitcoin in the form of a block reward and transaction fees. Other nodes in the network check the validity of the mined blocks. So right here is a good illustration of why one can't cheat the Bitcoin blockchain. Number one, everyone is working on block 91. Number two, one miner wants to alter a transaction at block height 74. Number three, that miner would have to make those changes as well as for block 74 through 90. And then number four, he would have to do all that work before block 91 propagates. So that goes to show why a blockchain is so valuable and why it has these sort of immutable transactions um, enabled by proof of work. So next up we have proof of stake. So what's with proof of stake and how does it address the Byzantine fault tolerance? For simplicity's sake, I'm gonna be referencing the documents around Ethereum and proof of stake. There's a lot of information on it and it's also the one that I understand the most. Proof of stake is a consensus method that depends on a validator stake in the network. So with proof of stake, validators are the entities that build blocks, similar to what miners do for proof of work, but at the same time, it's pretty different. A set of validators takes turns proposing and voting on the next block block and the weight of each validator's vote depends on the size of the deposit or the stake. According to the Ethereum GitHub on proof of stake, the leveraging of stake and proof of stake consensus can provide stronger security guarantees than proof of work consensus due to the bonding of collateralized capital. So with proof of stake protocols like Casper, they adopt security deposits at the core of their incentive mechanisms. Staking in itself provides a large economic incentive against malicious activity. So if a node is acting at a place and performing malicious activity, that collateralized capital can be forfeited or slashed by the protocol. So how does proof of stake address Byzantine fault tolerance? Its fault tolerance lies within the protocol as all validators have known identities, which are stable Ethereum addresses in this case. And the network keeps track of the total size of the validator set. There are many different Byzantine fault tolerance style proof of stake models. In one particular model, validators are randomly assigned the right to propose blocks, but agreeing on which block is canonical is done through a multi-round process where every validator sends a vote for some specific block during each round. And at the end of the process, all honest and online validators permanently agree on whether or not any given block is part of the chain. Traditional Byzantine fault tolerance theory simply requires that the safety is achieved if two thirds of the validators are honest. So like when I was first talking about it, this tries to prove that if a mechanism has a safety failure, then at least a third of the nodes are faulty. Whereas Ethereum's model tries to prove if a mechanism has a safety failure, then at least one third of the nodes are faulty and you know which ones they are, even if you're offline at the time the failure took place. This model doesn't demand proof that the network will come to consensus, but rather proof that it does not get stuck, which is really important. This brings us finally to DBFT, or Delegated Byzantine Fault Tolerance. DBFT is a consensus method for NEO, and it's different than the other methods I've described, but it takes advantage of some of the proof of stake-like features. For this explanation, I'll be taking most of my resources from NEO's GitHub consensus details. So to get started, NEO holders indirectly participate in the consensus process by being able to vote on who consensus nodes are. NEO uses a group of validators known as consensus nodes, they're also known as bookkeepers, in order to process and validate transactions. When the time comes to verify a block, one consensus node is randomly selected to propose that block as a speaker node. The speaker node is then responsible for sending the block to all the other existing consensus nodes, which will then decide if the presented block matches their own, and together they will verify if that presented block is correct. If at least 66% of the consensus nodes agree on that presented block, it is accepted and becomes the next state in the network. If less than 66% of them agree, a new consensus node is randomly selected to present a different block and the presentation restarts. So this might sound a little abstract, but I have some diagrams that I'll show in a second. During a consensus activity, the consensus nodes assume two different roles. There is a speaker, which will be the red node, and it'll be responsible for transmitting a block proposal to the system. And there are delegates, which are the green nodes. They are responsible for reaching a consensus on that block proposed. Another term I'm gonna be using soon is called view. All consensus nodes are required to maintain a state table to record current consensus status. A view is the data set that is used for a consensus from its beginning to its end. So if consensus cannot be reached within the current view, then something called a view change will be required. So how does this fit into the Byzantine generals problem? 
problem. I've pulled some graphics off of Neo's GitHub that will probably help illustrate the process. In the following examples, we are dealing with what is called a honest speaker situation. A consensus node is chosen at random by the protocol to act as the speaker node in red. The rest of the nodes are then delegate nodes. The honest speaker node sends a block proposal to the delegate nodes, but one of the delegate nodes is dishonest and sends a different block to the honest delegate. Because the delegate is dishonest, the honest delegate can only determine that there is a dishonest node, but it's unable to identify if it's the speaker or the delegate. Because of this, the honest delegate must abstain from voting, and so it changes its view, like I said before. In a similar situation with an honest speaker, there are three delegate nodes where one is dishonest. This result is slightly different. The speaker sends block proposal A to the delegate nodes, and the honest delegate shares the block A with other nodes, but the dishonest delegate sends a bad block B. Because we have two loyal nodes out of three, we have a 66 majority, which is what is required for DBFT consensus. Based on the consensus of the two honest delegates, we're able to determine that either the speaker or the right delegate is dishonest in the system. So what if the speaker really is dishonest in the system? In the case of this example, the dishonest speaker sends different messages A and B to honest delegates. Then the honest delegates send that message to each other. Because of the differing messages, neither honest delegate is able to determine which node is dishonest, so we run into that same issue as my first example. Because of this, the delegates must abstain from voting and they change their view. In this next example, the blocks received by both the middle and right node are not validatable. This causes them to defer for a new view, which elects a new speaker because they carry a 66% majority. In this example, if the dishonest speaker had sent honest data to two of the three delegates, it would have been validated without the need for a view change. When I'm saying they elect a new speaker, they are no longer dealing with the block because with a new speaker comes a new block proposal. So let's go a little bit deeper and break it down a little bit further. In this picture, a consensus node broadcasts a transaction to the entire network with the sender's signatures. After that step, a speaker has been identified by the protocol and the view has been set. The speaker then mints a new block proposal for review by the delegates. Then the delegates receive the proposal and validate the following criterion. Is the data format consistent with the system rules? Is the transaction already on the blockchain? Are the contract scripts correctly executed? And does the transaction avoid a double spend scenario? If something looks off, then the delegates change view and the progression of that block stops. If everything checks out, a consensus is reached and the approving delegates sign the block binding it to the chain. So that is a summary of DBFT consensus. Also, I'd like to address a misconception that a good amount of people think, and that's that NEO is proof of stake because they receive a dividend token for holding NEO, which is gas. Normal NEO holders are not helping to process transactions directly by staking NEO. They're just involved in NEO's economic model. Gas is generated by the NEO protocol every time a block is processed, which will eventually deliver 100 million gas through a decay algorithm in about 22 years time to addresses that hold NEO. If you are a consensus node, however, you get paid part of the transaction fees by the user in gas, in addition to the gas rewarded by holding NEO. Gas is used, but it's never destroyed, and it's redistributed inside the NEO network. So that's about all I could fit in this video. I hope I did an okay job at explaining the different consensus models. I know it can be pretty confusing and time consuming. So if you liked how I explained these things, go ahead and toss me a like and a subscribe. That would be fantastic. If you like proof of work, proof of stake, DBFT, or you just think that Byzantine is a cool word, please share this video. This video was put together with a bunch of fantastic resources that I'll link in the description for everyone to check out. If there's anything I missed or got wrong in this video, feel free to call me out. Um, we're all learning here. So let's keep the conversation going. I look forward to chatting with you all in the comments below and thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.